Um, so check it out, right? I got out of the psych ward. Now, and, and mind you, I haven't been in population since 13. I'm 19 now. I'm, I'm 19 now. Going on 20. I don't know nothing about society. I don't know shit about society. I never went to a restaurant. I never ordered food for myself. I don't got no driver. I don't, I don't know nothing. But the lady Lolita, she was one of the staff members in the crazy house. She came and picked me up. She was in love with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was in love with me. She used to like write me letters and stuff. She came and picked me up. She showed me everything. She helped me get my license. She showed me how to food. Just a woman. She showed me how to have sex with a woman. Cause I ain't know how to have sex with a woman for real. And she showed me how to have sex with a woman. She literally showed me how to do everything. <laughs> like for real, like she used to just come pick me up just to have sex with me and then be like, she had a husband, come to find out she had a husband and kids, she had kids and everything, she was going through a divorce. So an older woman, 37, something like that. Um, and uh, but yeah, she used to come get me and just have sex with me on her car. We used to just drive around. My man Richie got out of prison, which was my best friend. We went to go see him and she was so cool. She was like a mother figure. But she was my girl, but she was older. But then one day she burnt me. She burnt me. She gave me an STD. And uh, when she <laughs> found out she burnt me, she, she breaks up with me. She's like, Lee, this girl, she, she you know, she, people used to call me Lee back in the day. She's like, Lee, um, this is going to be so, she used to talk to me like a little, like, like a little kid. She's going to be like, Lee, um, there's going to be so many women that you're going to know in life. You're going to see so many women and you're going to make so many women happy, but we can't be together no more. And she like gave me this gift and this card and like spit off on me. Like I never seen her again. And like, it's crazy. But that was the first woman that taught me everything about sex and it's crazy. So um, after being in Willingboro for a while, uh, getting out of jail, I came home. I, I fucked around and went to uh, uh, the military because I, I, I needed a shelter, like a place to stay. So because I had everything on my juvenile record, as an adult, my record was clean. You know what I'm saying? So everything's on my juvenile record. So as an adult right now, if anybody tries to bring up anything that happened to me, this bullshit. I have no felonies on my record. I'm not a felon. That's all on my juvenile record. Anything that I got on my adult record, like dismissed. I ain't got no jail record. I, I went to jail, but I always like beat the charge or it was for like driving while suspended, just trying to figure out society, trying to get where I need to go. Most of my shit was driving while suspended. So, you know what I'm saying? Like I never really uh, was breaking no laws as an adult. I never, I, I ain't go, go out into the streets and start breaking no laws after prison. I, I was good. So I went to the army, right? <laughs> I went to the army <laughs> and um, they was like, yo, I, I went to boot camp in uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky in the middle wow. of the winter training with the Marines. I was training with the Marines. It was crazy. I, basic wow. training with the Marines. Yeah. I, 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 I never knew my full potential as far as my strength, my will, my power until I went to the hard knocks out there in Kentucky. And um, in the middle of the winter too, this shit was crazy. I did, um, I did, I did AIT in Maryland, AP Maryland, um, yeah, um, Joppa Town, Joppa Town, APG, Maryland. I, I was, I did my AIT there, and that's when it was like, that's when I got out. You know what I'm saying? I got out of the military right there. Um, they gave me an honorable discharge, a medical one, because I was not supposed to be in there because I, I had a medical history of being in a psychiatric ward. You know what I'm saying? So they let me go. You know what I'm saying? So you're not allowed to be. If you have, but they, but Bush was letting anybody in in, in that shit. You know what I'm saying? So I was never supposed to be in there. So they gave me an on. It was a mistake. So they gave me an honorable discharge. You see what I'm saying? When they see my record, they say, oh, he have a medical record of having to be in a psychiatric ward. We can't have him in the military. So they gave me an honorable because it was their mistake. They gave me an honorable discharge. So I left there and I went to Job Corps. Ah, me too, that's funny as hell. <laughs> I went to Job Corps, that's the only way I can get shelter. The only way I can get shelter. I'm out here by myself, I'm trying to get shelter. I went to Job Corps, it gave me three hots in a cot. I got a um a business degree there in, in, job, in job Corps. I had like a business um trade, I got a business trade. Yep. And 
got heavy they in the you Bible. you to go to school. Huh? I said they pay you to go to school. Like, right. I got my high school diploma in jail. They made, I got my degree in jail, my high school diploma in jail. So I got to graduate from Willingboro High School and, and I got my diploma in jail. So when I got out, I was able to go to Job Corps. I, I, I graduated the whole Job Corps. I was there for a year and a half or something like that. When I got out of Job Corps, I didn't have nowhere to go still. So I'm like, damn, where am I now? Which one so, you um, I started. I started renting a room, right? And one of my boys was like, yo, I used to sing a lot, I used to sing R&B. And one of my boys, he was a model. He was like, yo, you should be a model. He started showing me these headshots. He's like, you should be a model. So I was like, all right, cool. I'll take some, I'll take some, um, some photos. This is when I got introduced to the whole gay industry. You know what I'm saying? Like I was renting a room um, and I was taking pictures and I was like trying to like, people tell me I look like Tyson Beckford, right? And I didn't know who that was, but everybody used to always tell me you look like Tyson Beckford. Like, or, you know, I was like, damn, I, I didn't know who that was. But that dude All was right, like, he was voted like one of the sexiest men in the world. And I was like, damn, I do kind of resemble this dude. And I was like, damn, that's crazy. And, and, and I was seeing why I was getting all the women. I started adding up and everything. I'm like, wow, like I can make money for my looks. You know what I'm saying? So I started trying to be a model like this dude. And so I did get into the modeling industry a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I started doing music videos for like girl groups that was coming up. I did a music, I did a music video for 3LW. I did like I was doing music videos for these girls. You know what I'm saying? Like I was doing that. But then I um one day, one of the models was like, yo, you want to go to the strip show with me? We, you, you, he's like, yo, you still working out? We need an extra guy. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, we need an extra guy to come on the set. One of our guys are not there. So I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, yo, I'm about to take you with us. You want to make some money? I was like, hell yeah, I want to make some money. Like, hell yeah. They're like, yo, come on. They take me on a the set. They show me everything. And they're like, yeah, this is what you're going to do, right? <laughs> like, strippers. Like, this modeling niggas, they strippers. I'm like, oh, shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I started stripping. I made like $200 in that night. I was like, oh, shit, this is, this is good money. But I couldn't get connected back with them for some reason. So um yeah, I had left, I had left, oh somebody killed the dude I was living with. I was living on 27th Tasca in Philly. Somebody killed the dude that I was staying with, yo. And I had to oh, move no. out. Yeah, they killed him. And then I moved to Augusta with my sister. I found my sister in Augusta, my biological sister, right? And that shit was in a hood. I was living in a hood in Augusta, bro. I was like, yo, fuck, man. Like, and I was working at uh, Shapiro's where they kill cows. It's like this factory where they kill cows at. And it was crazy. I was coming home every day smelling like blood and it's fucking the worst smell you could ever smell. I was working in this 12 hour warehouse. I was working at Castleberry or, or, or you know, Shapiro's. And it's like, damn. So after that, my sister kicked me out. I started getting into arguments with my sister. So I was sleeping in the bush. I was sleeping outside in the, in the woods. and. A man seen me in the woods. I was going to work every day. I was going to go back to Philly after I get my check. My man seen me sleeping in the woods. He was like, yo, you can sleep in my van. I was like, thanks. But he was like, you know what? I got an extra room. You can sleep in my room. My nigga Cool Breeze, right? So I was like in Augusta. So I, it's in the middle of the winter. But I always had a woman. Like, even when I was broke, I always had a whole bunch of women. Like, I was the dude that was like, yo, Lee, where the, where the bitches at? He's always coming like, yo, Lee, where the bitches at? Because I always had a woman. I was like, yo, bring a friend for my friend. I always had a bad chick. Always. I ain't never changed. I always had bad chicks. I always had a woman, yo. Never been without a woman, man. Always some woman was there to take care of me, help me, hurt me. Whatever it was, I always there was always a woman, you know what I'm saying? So, um, uh, this girl I was talking to on the phone, she was supposed to come through. I, I, I got a crib now. I'm with, I'm with Kubri, so I'm thinking. And uh, she's supposed to come through. She was in Atkins, South Carolina. She's supposed to come through. And guess what? This nigga, um, this nigga mom pull up. And she like, get out my house. I, I was like, I thought this is Kubri's crib. He told me I could stay here. <laughs> But she, that nigga, she said, yo, get out my house, nigga. Atkins, yeah. And uh, so I was like, damn, it's in the middle of the night, and, sh and the shorties are on the way. I had to call shorty like, listen, we can't meet up because I'm in a situation right now. And my man, she like, 
man, don't worry about that. I still want to come see you. I'm like, this girl still want to come see me. I was like, shit. Um, you know what I want to do? I'm a, um, I'm a, I'm gonna let you come get me, but I'm on a, sh- I got, I got, my, I got clothes in bags, like plastic bags. I got my clothes in plastic bags. I'm like, shit. Um, if you come get me, I, I, I ain't got nowhere to go. She's like, it's okay. She just wanted to meet me. So I guess she wanted to, I met her on Black Planet. <laughs> Some shit like that. I guess she wanted to see if I looked like my pictures. And um, so I, she pulled up and I did look like my pictures. So she just like told me to get in with my bags and put my bags in the back of her, her, her car. I, I used to always be in black black bags. I was a, I was a bum nigga, you know? I was trying to figure it out. I ain't know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was that nigga, the nigga that lived out the black bag, nigga, like, <laughs> like straight up. And um, I uh, so she she picks me up, and I'm like, yo, I'm gonna be honest with you, I have nowhere to go. My man's mom just kicked me out the crib. She driving. I'm wondering like, where this girl going? And my mom, but I'm like, I'm warm because it's winter. I'm in her car. She's staring at me like, she's smiling at me, but she's staring at me like. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm like yeah, like she just staring at me and shit. She just as I'm telling her like yo, I ain't got nowhere to go. She like yo, you want something to eat? I was like yeah. She like she pulls up at McDonald's, give me something to eat. Back in the day, I was eating McDonald's. You know what I'm Ooh, that's hot. <laughs> <laughs> yo, was, yo, she was cool. She let me. She got me something to eat. Then we got on the hot. She went. She took me to the shelter to the um. To the Goodwill shelter. She took me to the shelter because I need to go to a shelter or something. So the shelter was closed. I was like, damn, they closed. She's like, get in. So we start driving and she not talking. Come to think about it, Shorty was a Gemini. She she was she she wasn't talking. She was just driving. You a Gemini number four? <laughs> wow. Yo, see. she was wild cool. Yeah, she a Gemini, all right. No. She was a southern girl who lived with her sister, but they was raising a family, in a church family, so they wasn't allowed to have boys in the crib. But she said she would sneak in her house after, she would hide me in a closet, if anything. I was Damn, like- Damn, yo. I'm like, all right, that's so sweet of you. So she driving. I'm like, damn, this girl is so sweet. Like, I'm like, this girl is nice. Um, we get to her house, and we just go to sleep, man. And she was holding me all night. Like, she was just holding me. I was like, oh my damn. I remember her just holding me. Like, she just holding me. I was like, damn. I got up. And she was like, get in the closet. Get in the closet. Get in the closet. And I'm getting in the closet with all these shoes and shit. She got hell shoes. I'm in the closet, duck dog. 15 minutes later, she come back in the room like, come on out. My sister know you here. Oh, and I'm like, come out. I'm like. Her sister flirting with me like, yo, you a football player? I'm like, nah, I'm not a football player, ma'am. She's like, oh, okay. And she's like, you know you gotta get out. I'm telling mommy, you gonna have to move out. She didn't even care. She was like, fuck him. I um my boss is a real estate agent. I'll get a I'll get an advance on my, my check this month and we'll go get our own shit. I was like, what? Like, so she got a hotel, she got an advance and got us in a hotel. We chilling in the hotel, like she do here. And she what's her name? So look, remember I was home, home in Augusta yeah. over there with Cool Breeze. So now I'm in a nice ass hotel. All of a sudden, <laughs> she doing here. She go to work. She let me get the car. I'm driving the car around. Guess where I drive to? I drive around in my sister's house. Like yeah, like I'm good, nigga. Like you know, what I mean? like, like y'all nigga try to kick me out, motherfucker. Chilling, nigga. Drove around, let niggas know I was good. <laughs> But, um, yeah, Shorty was like, yo, and then I got in touch with my peoples, right? That was from Philly. He was like, I was going back to Philly. He was like, yo, don't go back to Philly. Go to Atlanta. Come to Atlanta. Come to Atlanta. He was a gay friend of mine. He was like, yo, come to Atlanta. I was like, all right, I'll come to Atlanta. He's like, I'll let you stay with me for a month until you get your own place. Now, she heard that. She, she was like, I'll go there with you, too. I was like, what? Like, how you gonna leave your job? She was like, I'll trans. She worked at Office Office Depot. She said, I'll do a transfer from an Office Depot out here in Augusta to an Office Depot in Atlanta. And she did it. 
And she was like, I'll send you money and we'll put our money together. We'll get an apartment out in Atlanta. And I was in the hood. I was in a uh, college park in the hood. Oh, that's true. First. What the fuck, Chief? What are you following me or something? Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, so look, right? So I was I was with her and um I had found the I had found the barbershop to work at. I started making money. I found some apartments, some cheap apartments. I had put the down payment on the apartment. And one day Shorty came to visit me one weekend, right? Mm -hmm. And um she was so bold. Like Shorty was bold. Like she was like, I came in the car and she had a voicemail on and I heard the nigga voice. And I was like, yo, who that? Cause he was like, how now? He was like, he was like, nobody. I was like, now nah, who is that? She was like, listen, I gotta tell you something. I'm like, what's up? She was like, yo, I got an STD. I'm like, damn, what the fuck? She like, yeah, you need to go get tested for the STD and all this shit. I'm like, damn. And she also said, listen, also I want to break up. And because I did all this for you, you should give me the apartment. You should give me the apartment. And um, and we and we can go our separate ways. Since since I was like, damn, like that. Like Shorty said, give me the apartment. And I'm like, oh shit, I gave her the apartment. And um, and she was there for the weekend. So I was driving a car around trying to look for another barber shop to work at. And I had found this shop where this lady was working in there, right? And I had walked into the salon. I was gonna see if I could work at her, 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 her salon as a barber. And I walked in there, and all the women, you know, they all stop and look at me. I, every time I walk with a woman, at, they always look at me. Women always look at me. They always be like. And so I was like, can I speak to the owner? And so I come in there, and she like, she come out. She like, yeah, she give me her number. She was like, yeah, you could really cut hair. I was like, yeah. She was like, all right, cool. And so she gave me her number. And the next day, I start getting like, we were supposed to meet up for um interview, but I, I was dealing with the shit with the girl. And I was like scared. Like I had every time I went to the clinic back in the day, you didn't know if you was gonna have some shit or not. So you had to go get an HIV test, and that shit was like nerve-wracking back in the day. Like shit, I gotta go to the clinic. Like it was a whole experience. Like fuck. Like you have been, she's like, you need you, you need be with. I'm like, shit, like, all right, Miss Faith trying to get me a job all right so i go to miss faith and she like opened up her shop and she she let me cut somebody here and she seen i got skills she was like okay you could cut she was like i'm gonna let you um cut and back then my name was hands that's what i went by because i was good with my hands and i was like yo she let she, she uh she, we was doing an interview i let her know about my girl what i was going through and all this shit. and she was like really so the funniest thing is, it's getting darker. We're talking, she's talking to me about how she's gonna get flyers done. And I'm noticing like, Shorty dressed in, she dressed in this little flower dress, but it's kind of short and inappropriate. And I, I didn't pay no mind because back then I was kind of innocent. Like I, I didn't really, yo, back then I was really innocent and fucking naive. I ain't gonna lie. When I look back like, yo, I was stupid. But as I look back, I was like, oh, she goes in the back of the office. She like, yeah, I'm gonna show you these flyers. So we in the office and shit. And she kick off her shoes and she start rolling a blunt. I'm like, this in Atlanta. I'm like, oh, what the fuck? Like, Miss Faith, what are you doing? <laughs> like, she start rolling a blunt. And she was like, she was like, uh-huh. I was, she was like, Lee, she was like, yeah, Lee, but you ain't gonna have to worry about none of that no more. When I was talking about, I just kept talking with my girl, like, I can't believe this shit, man. She had me at the clinic, like, oh my God. She was like, yeah, but you ain't gonna have to worry about that no more. Like, she came and, like, rubbed my arm. And I was, like, looking at her, like, yo, what the fuck, yo? Like, this shit was crazy. Back then, I was real, like, kind of catch on. So I was like, yeah, I'm about to go. Yeah, I'm about to go. Like, so I was about to walk out the room. And she was like, she was like, so you gonna fuck me or what? I'm like, Yo, shorty pulled the condom out of fucking drawer and everything. And I was, she got a fat ass. She was red bone with a fat ass. All the niggas wanted, like, Miss Faith, yo. She had her own shop. She, like, I don't know why. She wanted me, but she just wanted me. She, she is particular. She, she was a Scorpio. She just had that flower dress on. I was fucking her on her desk, like, that was crazy. And then that, after that moment, after she, I guess she wanted to see what the dick was like. 
And then she, after she got the dick, she just took me. She was like, come with me real quick. And like, I dropped the car off um, back to Shorty. And then I got in her car and she drove me to her crib. And I could not believe in my mind, I could not conceptualize that this woman had a two bedroom apartment by herself. Like, I, like in my mind, I never seen no shit like that. I'm sorry, I'm from the hood. This woman had a two bedroom apartment. And I was like, you know, she, one of the rooms she just used for her closet. And I was like, she was she was getting money out I, I, in my mind i didn't think in my mind i'm like nah because she had more than one toothbrush in the fucking bathroom so i'm like not knowing she just used a couple toothbrushes right? so later on i, I wind up moving in i'm like i can't believe this woman is really you know what i'm saying is really motherfucking doing this shit like she really got her own crib and she's like you could live with me and i'm like what like so yeah it was on like she took me everywhere around Atlanta she showed me the whole Atlanta like shorty was like a dude she was like a dude she was real sexy though like a stripper body bad as shit she did here she wasn't no stripper though but everybody wanted to fuck her in the neighborhood like where she lived at all the niggas used to try to like get cool with me so they could figure out how the fuck I'm fucking her like you know what I'm saying like it's always like yo you you, you that nigga that's with Miss Faith huh my like, yeah, he used to play games. They play like uh, we used to go over there and play Madden and shit with the dudes around the neighborhood. But they was trying to figure out how the fuck, was, who the fuck I was, and why would she be fucking with me? But that didn't end well. Uh, it became really abusive. I was the chick and she was the nigga. It was real weird. Like when she used to like, she used to like, we used to go in public, and niggas, drug dealers used to come up to her, be like, "What's up, baby?" And she used to never like introduce me. Right? But she was hella possessive of me. Like, we was in a Jamaican spot one time and these girls, they was flirting with me. And one girl had took took my hat and she snatched the fucking hat out of her hand. She was like, or she was really possessive. But I, like, when it came to her, like she would be at the shop and I'd be cutting hair. And my, me and my niggas be sitting around at the little barber area and niggas with nice ass cars would pull up to the shop. And, um, she would go outside in front of all my mans. And I'd be like, hurting inside. I used to after we're like, yo, man, what the fuck going on? Why are you doing? Why you who are these niggas driving up like that? She was like, those is my friends. I was like, damn. Phone was always ringing. You know what I'm saying? Where is the admins? I don't even know. You an admin? Say something in the room so I can make you an admin. Oh, the admins is here. All right, so look, right? So every time we got into an argument, the only thing, I, the only leverage I had was that I'm leaving. So I would pack my bags and I would just walk out, say I'm leaving. And she would say, yo, come back, come back, come back. And I would come back to her. She would have like rose petals and shit. She would treat me like a chick. That was crazy as I look back. I was a little bitch nigga. Like, I was the bitch in a relationship. And so she, um, <laughs> they listen to this shit like, really, Chief? Nah, before I was like the nigga that, um, then after a while, she, she became to get violent. She became violent. She became violent. Like, yo, start throwing my clothes out when I was about to leave. Like putting hands on me, choking me so I won't leave. Like try to choke me out one time, yo. Like really, I was being abused. Like yo, like you don't believe it, but men can be abused in relationships, bro. Like I was really one of them niggas, bro, that was getting hands put on me. Like, like she was treating me like a child, bro. Like basically, she'll throw my clothes that was in bags. Like get your broke ass out of here, nigga. Da 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 da. Throw my shit out. Like damn, yo. Then one day I just snapped and I hit her back and um. I didn't hit her, I just choked her up. She got scared and I was packing my bags to leave and she didn't want me to leave. So she made this scene. She was like, oh my God, he's trying to kill me. So the maintenance man was knocking on the door and she started screaming like, oh my God, help me. And she walked, she ran outside with her t-shirt on. The whole neighborhood was out there and the motherfucker, and I'm like packing my bags up, trying to get my clothes in time. Like, yo, this bitch crazy packing my bags up, putting my shit on, and I'm I'm walking out the, 
the door and the maintenance man pull a desert ego to my chest like he was like man hold on stay right there i was like this white dude i'm on the balcony you gotta get down the balcony you gotta get down these steps and he pointing the fucking desert eagle at my chest everybody downstairs looking up like damn he tried to hold me while the police on the way I was like, yo, my nigga, I'm y'all see this nigga? I ain't touch her, yo. I'm about to bounce. This nigga popped me, it's on him. So I walked away because I wasn't about to get locked up. The police is, you can hear them coming from a mile, like, Woo! I was like, damn. So I'm running. The police see me. I'm hiding behind trees and shit. I'm running. It's cold as shit outside. I see the police see me right there. He started running to me like the motherfucking terminator. I start running. I lost them niggas. I'm hiding behind trees and shit. And the nigga was like, I had to call my nigga Kenny, like, yo, from, from, um, where, where was he at? I called my nigga Kenny, he like a, he like a, a R&B ass nigga, man. He be singing R&B and shit, the woman. So Kenny come pick me up from Alpharetta. He came from Alpharetta with his white girl. He stayed with white girls, black dude. So I sneak in the car with him. I lay low. All these police outside the apartments, he like, yo, bro, they all out there thinking something wrong with that girl. I'm like, so they... I had, this is this is when this is this is when my light took a turn it's right here. This is when it took a turn, right? Shit, we went to Alpharetta. It's the coldest night of my life. I had to go to work the next day. I was sleeping in this car. It was cold as shit. It was no heat on in the car. I was sleeping in this abandoned car, bro. And in my in my head, that night traumatized me from the cold, like cold weather. Like it was so fucking cold in that car. It changed my life, bro. In that moment, I realized, like, yo, bro, I'm not going, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ever going to be homeless again. I have nowhere to call, nobody to call. You know what I'm saying? So, boom, right? Right? Boom. So, I was cold as shit that night, so cold that it was hurting. And I was just trying to make it to the AM. I was sleeping in that car. No heat on, nothing. And I, it was cold as fuck. And I remember I said, shit, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm, I'm gonna go, get, I'm gonna go, I'm, I'm never, cause I'm, again, I'm out there by myself. So, uh, I went to work that day. I went to the barbershop, took a, um, they was calling me like, yo, you got clients. But the barbershop I was working at was taking 50% of my money. So meaning that if I got a $20 haircut, he was taking 50% of that shit. So I was getting $10 a haircut. I wasn't making a lot of money. So, um, I started, I, on my lunch break, I went to the shelter in, in the West End of Atlanta. I was working in the West End. I went to the shelter in the West End. And the motherfuckers was like, uh, the shit was dirty as shit. I'm like, damn, I can't stay here. And the counselor that was there was like, yo, bro, you don't know nobody. You seem like a a young guy. You handsome. He's like, you probably you probably got some family. I'm like, I don't got no family. My family in Philly. Charmaine, her mom was going to let me come stay with her in Philly, but I needed enough money to get there. I ain't have enough money to get there. But I remember, I was so desperate because the, the night was coming and I ain't have nowhere to stay. My, I was asking my man, can I sleep in his car? He was like, nah, bro, you can't sleep in my car. I was like, shit, I had nowhere to go, nobody to call, I could barely keep my phone on. I was really fucked up in the game, bro. And I was out there by myself, bro. And I felt so alone in the world, bro. So fucking alone in the world, bro. But then I remembered, Right when I was in the military, I had this gay friend. His name was uh, Bobby, and Bobby used to always tell me I could be a stripper. He like, yo, you should, you should be a, a, a gay stripper. There's this gay stripper called White Chocolate, and he's making a lot of money. And that shit, you know how you get desperate. The last, I, I was trying to find the last resources. So I call, I call Bobby. He picks up on the first ring. It's about to be nighttime. I'm like, yo, Bobby, what's that dude's number, bro? Like, I, I want, I need some money. You know what I'm saying? I need some money. And he was like, oh, Lee, you fine decided. It's like kind of getting on Bigo. Niggas like, oh, you, you getting on Bigo? Okay. That's like that. He was like, oh, you gonna be a stripper? Okay. Yeah, you gonna make a lot of money. I'm like, he was like, here's the dude, mama. I call the dude. I, I just explained to him like, yo, bro, I ain't got nowhere to go. Either I, I it's cold outside. You, I'm, I'm, I'm about to be homeless. He like, send me pictures of yourself. So I sent them pictures of me. He like, I'm on the way to come get you right now. He came and got me. I went from the West End to Atlantic Station. Now these dudes are gay. He got a stripper on the side of his Mustang. He pulls up. 
I got my bag. She's like, give me your bag. They weren't even talking. They're like, get your bag. I was like, all right. So I like, yo, I ain't give a fuck. I was like, nigga, I want to make some money, bro. I need some money. I'm trying to get my own crib. I need to make some money. I don't give a fuck. He was like, and then I went into his crib. I never seen nothing like that. I never been in no crib like that. I never been to a luxury apartment, nothing like that. I was in a, it was in Atlantic Station. I never seen nothing like that. So when people tell you my story, I tell you my story. I'm I'm very open. Like I'm very transparent with my with, with people. Like I don't lie to nobody. My story is my that's not my my life belongs to you. So never listen to what somebody else said about me, because I could always tell you the truth about everything that's going on with my story. I'm very transparent because I healed over a lot, and I believe that my story belongs to y'all for y'all to for y'all to utilize and do whatever you want with it. So um, I'm gonna be very vulnerable in this moment and tell you things that you're gonna be like, what the fuck? Did he just say that he said he did that? Like, yeah, like I'm gonna tell you everything about me, like everything, not what you think you hear or clips of what you think you hear. I tell you about me and I'm honest about my story because I feel like a life happened to me and it wasn't, I don't own my experiences. It's, it's, it made me what I am. It's the ingredients that made this being that you see right now. So I own every bit of the way, you know what I'm saying? So. I became a, a a male, gay male stripper. Just a stripper. He told me, first you start dancing for the guys. I was part of his company. First you're going to dance with the guys, and then you're going to dance with the girls. I, now, mind you, I'm not gay, but I'm about to go dance for men. So it don't matter. Like, it don't matter. It's money. And it was something. And this nigga living like this, I was like, bro, I asked him a question. I'm like, bro, can, can I live like this? Can I make enough money to live like this if I do this? He's like, hell yeah. I was like, nigga, I'm on. Set me up. I didn't give a fuck about what nobody thought about me. I was alone in the world. I spent the night in that cold ass car. Nigga, I ain't have no mom, no dad, no uncle, no nothing. Nigga, I don't give a fuck. I'm about to do this shit. So, took me out to a club. I forgot the name of that club in Atlanta, man. A gay club in Atlanta, bro. And I'm on one of these boxes. And um, he makes the outfits and everything. So, he's hooking me up he gave me my he, he called some girls like yo i'm gonna send you pictures we need to give him a name and he was like oh call him tyson i'm like what you mean y'all gonna call me that nigga like they call me tyson that was my name they named me tyson i was like fuck it i'll use it as a gimmick it doesn't matter to me i'm a poor guy i'm a poor black nigga out here and i ain't about to go sell drugs and go to prison so fuck it i had a nice size penis you know what i'm saying so i had a nice body and i'm about to go make this money so i go and this dude takes me I made, he took me on a tour from Atlanta to damn near Cali, to all the gay clubs. And I'm making money that I never known before. Like, this is like crazy. I'm getting, I've never been broke again a day in my life, ever. And um, so I started meeting other straight dudes that was hustling, doing it too. You know what I'm saying? It was a hustle, you know what I'm saying? Other straight dudes was doing the shit too. And I was like, wow, it, was, it, it became okay for me because I met other dudes that was doing it and I ain't feel so bad. My first night out, I made like two, three hundred dollars and I was like, and he put me up in the room. He put me up in the room. He knew I wasn't gay. He knew I was like kind of rough. Like I was like kind of a gangster. Like, like I got a temper, you know what I'm saying? So when you round me, you can feel my presence. Like I'm not having that. Don't play with me, my nigga. Like, I got that attitude about me. You know what I'm saying? When you're around me. Um, so I, oh, he was kind of scared of me, I think. I think he was kind of scared to like play with me in that way. So he just put me in a he put me, he put me in a room during during um Katrina. He put me up in a hotel. He had scammed it, put me up in a hotel, and I had me a little kitchen. Nigga, this is my first place. My first place, nigga. I was making my own money, I had my own spot. In a little in a little hotel, nigga, you couldn't tell me I wasn't doing me, nigga. I was by myself, and I was by myself, and I was making money. And I told myself I will never ever be homeless again. I gotta love me. I gotta fucking do whatever it takes to make sure that I never end up back asking somebody, can I sleep in a fucking car or under their bed or fuck. I gotta do whatever it takes to make sure I survive out here. And this shit is making me fucking money, nigga. And I ain't give a fuck about what nobody said about me, nigga. But, and I, but I always carried myself in a way where I was never, I, I'm not, in my, in my head, it was easy for me because I'm, I'm an actor. Like, I could be an actor, I play the role. Because at the end of the day, I'm a, I'm a big dude. I'm like 6'2". I'm tall, like I'm muscular, nigga. Like, a nigga ain't just about to do nothing to me in no gay club, nigga. I'm going to beat the shit out of you. And the way I carry myself, 
you could kind of tell like, oh shit, like this nigga, oh hey, how you doing? Like ease up on this nigga, like, you know what I'm saying? So I never had the problem of being scared about anybody violating me or nothing like that. So I, I didn't mind because my sexuality was very secure in my sexuality. You see what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, I was like, yo, I started dancing for men and men was paying me so much money to, you know, to go dance over here, dance over there. And then, um, then I was, I kept asking, um, the dude, I don't know if I want to say his name, but cause I don't want to bring him into this, but I kept asking when I'm going to dance for the girls. Cause he had this company they, they, that people would book me. They were booked, they booked me through all these shows in New Orleans and Louisiana. I got to travel everywhere doing this shit, right? I was making money hand over fist. The thing about it is he was giving me 150 and he was taking the other 150. It was 300 to book me, but he was taking 150. And I was wondering like, why is this nigga doing this all this for me? But he was getting a cut of it. He was getting a cut. He was getting his cut off the top. He was giving me 150. You think I was complaining about getting 150 at the door? Plus like $300 in tips. Like, yo, every time I went out there for like an hour, hell no, nigga, like, give me that. I didn't give a fuck. It was not till later to other people start telling me, like, yo, this nigga hustling you. You could be making all your money yourself. And you gotta, you gotta start networking with the DJs and talking to people and booking your own shows and driving out yourself. And I was like, damn, that's crazy. So Man, the gay dudes love me, man. They absolutely love me. They praise me, man. They praise me like a god. You feel me? They put me on a pedestal. And I felt good about myself. I felt real good because they loved me. Like they like, they like straight men. They, they like they like that shit. It's a hustle. You feel what I'm saying? And the more the, they felt my spirit, the more they they know, they know you, you know what I'm saying? And they like the idea of you being straight. And they, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a chase for them. It's a whole thing that they do. So they know you straight, but they still want to see if they could, you know what I'm saying? Get with a straight dude or turn them, you know what I'm saying? So it was all a hustle. So um, this is when I, this is so one night I'm in a club and then this is when I realized I like transsexuals. Because I had seen, the only thing that I had in the gay clubs that were girls were transsexuals. So it was the closest thing I could see. So one day I'm in this club and I seen this transsexual. She, she looked just like a girl. And I ain't even know straight up like that she wasn't a girl. And she took me in the bathroom and I had I had sex with her. And that was like, that was like a, it was, it was good. It was really good. I was like, damn, damn, that was crazy. I never forgot that experience. That made me like them more. Like I wanted to have that experience again. Cause it was, it was crazy. So um, I forgot the name of that club in Atlanta, but then I started dancing for women. And they would, the women would pay you, but they didn't pay you like the guys did. So I, I like dancing for women because it got me a lot of attention from women. And women was like um, um, paying me to have sex with them. And I was a gigolo and I was like, I would do massages and whatever. I became uh, a male escort, a male escort. I was a male escort for guys and women. Like I would do the massage. I would jack off for dudes. I did all that stuff. Like, you feel me? Like it, it, I was gay for pay. You know what I'm saying? Like I was, I was that world. I made a lot of money, traveled a lot of places, and so when you see me on that, um, they show you like a doctor video and shit. I was young, I didn't know about the internet, and he was paying. He didn't pay me no fucking fifty dollars, nigga. He paid me two thousand dollars to do that scene, and it's a gay scene that's going around about round with me. And I'm doing an exam with a doctor. You feel me? And at the time, like it was a hustle for me, so I didn't really care. You know what I'm saying? So he wanted to jerk me off, you know what I'm saying? And do a, a, a rectal exam and all that. So I didn't know that the, the internet was gonna be this big now. Like, I didn't know that they was gonna catch that and be like, oh yeah, remember this shit? Wow, like I'm saying, so this shit. They, I did not know that video would ever, I didn't know that, I knew that dude was recording cause he had a website. He was doing physicals for guys. You feel what I'm saying? And then child talking about he, injected people with, with stuff. He didn't inject nobody with nothing because it was nothing inside the needle at all, period. I knew it was nothing inside the needle. He faked it. He faked the whole thing. Like, actually, that was part of it. Like, so, you know what I'm saying? So, whatever you hear out there on that dumb shit, I wasn't a part of that. I don't know what else he was doing, but I wasn't a part of it because I made sure, like, yo. So, you know what I'm saying? So, um, I, 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 I was hustling, man. I was out, I'm out here in the world by myself still. You know what I'm saying? I just have the people that I, I meet. You feel what I'm saying? So, um, as I kept going, I was I was just dancing. Oh, I got so big dancing. I got so big dancing, right? And I started dancing for the woman, but that's who I really wanted to dance for anyway. 
but the women just don't pay enough. God damn, the women, they, they take it lightly. You feel what I'm saying? The guys, they pay 20. They, they tip like you a stripper. Like, the guys tip for real. Like, they making money. So it was cool. Like, I had a phase where I was only dancing for women, but my money was getting lower. And I ain't like that. You know what I'm saying? So I had to think about life. Like, damn, do I want to fuck all these women and um and be a stripper and fuck all these women and my money is shriveling away, right? Or do I want to, like, make this money? So I had to, like... I had to work for the guys and it was a pleasure doing it for the woman. You feel me? So I got the, I was doing all kind of um, bachelorette parties for women. You feel what I'm saying? Like I was like, uh, I would come as the mailman or the firefighter and I would show up and, you know, do do my dizzle. You know what I'm saying? I was really good because I could do like backflips and shit. I'd throw women around and shit. It was fun. And with the guys, I didn't have to do so much because the guys was, you know what I'm saying? Like, the guys, they just happy to see you, nigga. It don't take much to please a dude. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it was it was real easy with the dudes. But I was attracted to transsexuals that, from that one experience. And I've always been, you know what I mean? the one, Not the ones that look like dudes, but the ones you can't even tell. Like, I'm attracted to femininity. I had to learn that uh, in my life. Why, why was I like that? I had to be honest with that and just come forward with my own self and be real. Like, yo, why do you like transsexual? Because they look like women. That's why. In my mind, I think of them as women. You feel what I'm saying? So that's why I was attracted to them at that time. And then when I was in the gay club, I I was like, damn, bro, they'd be like the only kind of woman in that motherfucker. So that's when I, you know what I'm saying, was getting into that. And I always had a girl, yo. After that, I start having, um, let me get a charger. I always had a girl that knew about what I was doing. She would come collect my money. Like, I never really hid that shit from the woman I was dealing with. Like, they would come to the gay club with me. And they would be, like, collecting my money. Like, you know what I'm saying? So my chick knew um, what I was doing. But I only messed with the best woman that I could find that would, you know what I mean, be down with me no matter what. And women always was down with me to do, to go on a tour. I used to sell my calendar. I a calendar. I made, like, 20000 off this calendar. I was making a lot of money traveling the world i went across seas uh being a male entertainer being a gigolo i got to fly all over the world man like it was i got to see life and understand women to a deeper level like i remember being naked in front of so many women and just talking to them just be sitting there naked after the show just talking to women i'm so comfortable with women i have a i have a deep relationship with women like um so like uh and they always follow me no matter what so like for me yeah, that's why that's what happened with me. So niggas niggas can say I'm gay or whatever. I already lived a thug life. I, I was raised up thug life. You know what I'm saying? Like that thug life is cool, but niggas gotta survive. So I did what I needed to survive. You feel me? I I found the loophole in the system and I and I made it out. So from that point on, I never was broke again, ever. Cause I knew I had a hustle. You feel me? So but the thing about it, I did it for 10 years. I was in the sex industry for 10 years. And I don't fuck all kind of women. Like, it's crazy. Like, I don't fuck, I don't do a lot of shit sexually. So I, I was able to sexually experience things. Um, I'm just not gay, man. I'm just not into men. If I was, I would tell you, bro. Like, just not into dudes, bro. Like, dudes don't just don't turn me on. Like, get my dick hard. Like, I don't get in, I don't get into it. Like, I've been in situations, bro. Where it's just like, nah, it's not what I, it's not what my body wants. It's not who I am. You feel me? I love femininity. So, I knew that for sure. I knew dudes that don't even know what the fuck they are because they've never been in that situation or open-minded to it. You know what I'm saying? So I've been in a situation where it was like, nah, my shit ain't working. I'll tell you the situation. So one day I was, uh, ah, this is a good story. It was a music director. And uh, he, he was in love with me. He was in love with me. Absolutely in love with me. He, just, he, he would buy me stuff. I've had clients, like these gay dudes that would stalk me. Like they would stalk me. They would just like buy me anything, fly me anywhere. Like it would, I was spoiled. Like gay people spoiled me, straight up. Women and gay people spoiled me. So I had this guy, he was a movie director. He flew me out to LA and um, I was gonna try to be gay because he had a lot of money and I could make it like into the movie industry. I could make it up, you know what I'm saying? If I could be gay, man, if I could just be gay, I could have been, I was gonna set my mind and like try to be gay. I was gonna do. I was gonna try to uh, to force myself to be gay so I could have a better lifestyle. And the money was the motive motivation. So we went out. Had the Porsche truck, all that shit, crazy. 
took me all the way around. From all around. I seen all the celebrities. I was in the crowd with celebrities and everything. I just could not perform. I couldn't do it. My dick couldn't get hard. The kissing shit made me want to throw up. Kissing the man just made me want to throw up. That shit was nasty. Um, just touching me made me like, you know what I'm saying? Kind of like, I couldn't do it. it just, it just, He just told me like, you're not gay. I was like, I know. And I was like, in a way I was mad because I couldn't be bisexual. I was upset with myself because I was like, damn. Because had I been bisexual, nigga, I'd be in the movie industry right now. <laughs> nigga, I would have been up there. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, if I could have sex with dudes and women, shit. Nigga, I probably wouldn't be the Messiah. But, um... <laughs> Oh, not be on a spiritual path, nigga. I'll be rich somewhere in a fucking mansion somewhere. Like, my soul, my soul to the devil. Straight up. If my dick got hard for dudes, shit. <laughs> Man, I would have manipulated my way through a whole lot of shit. It would have been crazy. I would have been fucking dudes. And women. Nigga, I would have been the illest nigga alive, though. I would me, who I am, I would be the illest nigga alive. If that's how I really got down. But peep game. So I went home, but it was very confusing for me because I was like, damn, I had to go right, right back to my regular ass life, even though it was a nice life anyway. But coming from his life back to my life it was depressing. And I was like, damn, yo, why can't I be bisexual? That's how I know. That's how I know I'm not. I'm not. I'm not um, bisexual or gay. Cause I I tried it. <laughs> All right. So I tried it. It's not my thing, man. It's not my thing. And if I was, boy, I would not be on this path. Anyway, so after being in the sex industry for ten years, I got. I was disgusted every time my phone rang. It was about sex. I got disgusted with it. It was so superficial, like everything was about sex, 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 sex. I saw things were about with sex. And I knew I wanted to tap into something else in me, which is my soul, which is my soul purpose. So it wasn't feeding my soul purpose and it made me sick, like in my, like to my stomach, like to the, it made me nauseous that every time my phone rang, it was a lot of money. Like it was always money. Like it was always money in my phone. Like I, I never, I, I had so much opportunities. It got to the point where I was fucking other niggas, other niggas wives for them for like $1,500. Like there's this one couple, he wanted me to fuck his wife. I used to have, uh, man, I was doing all kinds of shit, bro. He used to have me come in the house. He's put like uh, $1,100 under the, under the doormat, right? And he got a badass wife. Oh my, I never forgot his wife, bro. But he used to have me fuck her on on camera. It's a video of me fucking his wife, probably somewhere out there floating around. But uh, <laughs> I used to fuck a couple nigga white boys. I let him tape it for extra. And he used to pay me. And I don't know if he was in a closet or something. And I don't know where he was at in the house, but his wife would be laying on the bed butt naked and I come in there and tear that pussy up. I never met the guy. He always texts me. She loved it. She wants to see you again. Are you available? Every time, every time the text message came through, boy, I knew that was a quick left hundred. Left hundred real quick to fuck this fine ass woman, man. I used to love getting that text message. A couple text messages that when I got them, I was like, yeah. Like I'm about to go hit this man. But I used to think about her all the time, like, unbelievable. Yo. She was some kind of athlete or something, and she never looked at me. She was just on the bed, butt-ass naked with that nice-ass body, and I used to come in there, and I don't know if he was in a closet, but I know there was a camcorder right there, and he used to take me fucking his girl, like, wow, fucking her, just, just fucking her, crazy. I used to be fucking her. I made sure I fucked her good, like, for an hour, like, straight, like, I made sure she was coming, because I wanted to make sure they hit me back, nigga. <laughs> I used to fuck the shit out of her, and she used to be like, go. Oh. Be coming all crazy, and I used to man, and that's when I when they call me back every other week, they used to hit me. Hey, you ready? Hey, you ready? I'm like, hell yeah, 
cup out. But after a while, it made me sick because I wasn't feeding my soul and I was coming into my purpose of um, a higher learning. I've always been a guy that had a higher thought process, like wanting to know how things work. I was always a little bit eccentric and I never was a part, never, I've never been a part of society like that. Like I've always been a little different. Even when I was in the hood, we used to sit around, drink blunt, I mean, smoke, smoke weed, uh, hit, uh, drink liquor together, call the bitches up. I used to be on the stoop, like, looking in the sky, like, yo, it's a whole world out there, my nigga, like, niggas be like, man, shut the fuck up, you know what I'm saying? We got $20, let's go get this blunt and it's, and it's 40. You feel what I'm saying? Um, so, then, after that, I just got depressed. I was like, damn, I had called my photographer. My photographer was like, man, why don't you just change your number? And I was like, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. So I changed my number and I started hanging with this dude named Mike Brown. Now y'all know about Mike Brown, anybody that know about me, they might have heard about Mike Brown. I met Mike Brown, he was one, he started off as one of my clients. Mike Brown started off as one of, one of my clients as far as um, male escorting. He would get massages from me. He became real cool. He wanted to like, he, he was, he was more than a, a client. He would, he would, he wanted to, uh, he wanted to get to know me. Like he was a philosopher. He was a, he became like someone that I, I, I went to and went out with and with, he would just pay me just to go out for drinks, like just to go chill with him. And I used to look forward to it because he would take, he would, we would have to dress up and we would have to go to these um, events where there was these, all these intelligent people, right? Mike was one of my clients, but it was intelligent minds. These were professors and doctors and, you know, cause he was up there in, in the scholarship. And I used to have like all these conversations that used to it stimulated a part of me, this part of me that I am now, where I was like, yo, you know, wow. Like, I like hanging with Mike. I like Mike. I, I actually like Mike as a like a as a person. Like he was really cool to hang around. And he opened up a side of me, like a philosoph philosophical, philosophical, spiritual side of me that made me think, you know what I'm saying? I like that. And that's what I was looking for. It's feeding me. So uh Mike became a great supporter in my life where he just started to just give me that unconditional love. He heard my story and he started to become like a genuine friend in my life, looking out for me, dog. Like a genuine friend, like no, like on no shit. Like he was looking out for me. He made a lot of money and he started, he put me on there as a count. Like I be, he came like my, I want to say my father, but like a mentor. But he said I should have been in college. I should have got a degree and, and doctor. He used to see the intelligence in me. He used to take me, we used to have these arguments with people and his friends used to be like, where's that guy at? You know what I'm saying? Because I was such an interesting mind and we would sit at the tables with these expensive restaurants and like have these conversations that were just philosophical for hours and laughing and smoking cigars and drinking liquor. And these guys are making money. They work for like uh, colleges and their professors and their, you know, scholars. And I got to hang with him and, and he's opened that part of me up, man. Um, and he became just like a friend, like a genuine friend, man. So when people uh, was like, Mike is your gay lover, like online and stuff like that, that shit hurt me, man, because because they, they, they disrespected him, like, you know what I'm saying? And he, and he almost lost his job for that shit, you feel what I'm saying? Like the trolls went to his website and he's like the dean of a college and they like blew up his website and you know what I'm saying? Like he was... He always look out for me. He, if I need something from him, like he attached me to his account, and he was always like, he he can't, he don't have no son, no father, no mother. He's a gay guy, but he really loved me. Like we really had a bond. Like I was like his, I want to say his son. I became like something that he loved. You know, I mean? we loved each other. Like a, it was a bond, like not a sexual bond, but it was like a real. I care about you. I want to see you well. Bond. Like you know what I mean. Like one per person I met in my life that, you know, it's not, it's not many people you meet that unconditionally love you. Like no matter what, they're there for you. And this dude happened to be one of those people, bro. You feel what I'm saying? And he was like really there for me always. You know what I mean? It was like a bond beyond anything else. And so like if I, like, if I needed help with money, we like always make sure I have money in my account. He was always there for me. Oh, and he, we became like family. Like we would travel together being cool. like. He would like hire escorts. 
I would hire like female escorts, you know what I'm saying? Like, and we were, I don't even know how to explain the bond. Like it was like, and I, and I, and to this day, I love them. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like my, I don't have a lot of people in this life that I could say that were there for me unconditionally, that got my back, that love me no matter what. No matter what somebody said about me, no matter what happens, I never had that kind of love where somebody loved me unconditionally. There's always been conditions to the shit I've been dealing with out here. And I'm still out here by myself, but I can count on my hand how many people I know I can call on unconditionally. You know what I'm saying? And I was just talking to my friend today, Malcolm. No matter what, Malcolm has always been there for me, man. No matter what. You feel me? That's one of my friends. And, and, and because of this situation, I guess there was a condition because Mike stopped fucking with me because they almost made him lose his job. And he told me that he didn't want me to come out here and do this. He wanted me to go to college and he wanted me to be a professor and teach like that. And I, he said I had that kind of potential. He's like, yo, you, I can get you enrolled in school. And I was like, nah, man, I'm taking the nature route. He did not want me to take this route. So we split paths. And um, every now and then I'll get a random text message from him. But he was very upset that he had got involved in my shit. And um, and I you know I feel bad that they did that to him, man. It was fucked up, bro. Like it almost fucked his whole life up. You know what I'm saying? Like everything that he worked so hard for, he had climbed the ladder and became like the dean of a college, yo. That's how intelligent this man was. He he had his own college. He became the president, not the dean. I'm sorry, the president of a college, the president of a college. He had worked all the way up, and so. You know, because he was my family, when I left out on my journey, I had a certain amount of budget that he would allot me. Like, okay, here, you can have 2000 He was making like 15000 a month. He'd be like, here, 2000 3000 a month for me. It was nothing because it was just me and him. He didn't have a lot of stuff in his life. He was traveling and stuff. He was by himself. He had, you know, his, his stuff that he does, but he, I had access to that money. You know what I'm saying? And, put my name on the account and everything he was like my he looked out he's my only family that I had you know? and I lost that on this journey and it was real scary for me at certain points on this journey because um when that happened with Mike that was my only income and then I had no more income you know what I'm saying and so I've been just living off the universe providing for me in, in different ways and I've been out here on this journey just you know the poor righteous teacher type shit you know what I'm saying